I think Button is, first and foremost, a lover of laughter, of beauty, family, friendship, and faith. Sounds like our kind of person, right? She is an author, The Waiting Place, Learning to Appreciate Life's Little Delays. Uh, you notice that it doesn't say how to tolerate them, how to put up with them, how to overcome them, appreciate them. She is a columnist for Women to Women magazine, and she's a former community columnist for the Flint Journal. I think that's where we became acquainted because I would reach her column and invariably have to write and tell her how much I enjoyed it. She, an adjunct professor, I was going to learn adjuncts, so maybe you could teach me. <laughs> In communication, now you know I really need it at that, that my community college. She's a wife of Brad Button, the love of her life. 22 years, the mother of three fun-loving children, Stephen, 17, Christina, 14, and Jordan, 11. Please help me welcome Eileen Button. And it's true that Yvonne and I um, became acquainted really through the community column that I wrote for the last six years for the Flint Journal. And anyone who knows Yvonne knows how very gracious and wonderful she is. And I just want to thank you very much for, first of all, having the courage. Some people have really need the courage to write a writer, I guess. And so for having the courage for us to do that, and then for the friendship that we have um, developed, I am truly grateful. Um, if you're like me, you will spend some time this week, if you have not already, spent this time in a very sacred place. The Isles of Hallmark. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not Hallmark, maybe it's more like Walmart or Target or Meyer, but you'll be there if you haven't been already. And you will be surrounded by the colors of peach and pink and gold and silver and good wishes. And if you're like me, you spend an awful lot of time in front of that aisle. You stand there and you do the dance, don't you? You stand, you look, you pick, you open, you read, you grimace, you close, and you put it back. Why is that? I mean, really, why is it? Is it because really the Hallmark people do not know how to write a good part? Is that it? I mean, sometimes it does feel like that, but I don't think that's it at all. I think it takes so long. How many of you does it take a long time to get the Mother's Day grab card, whatever it is that you're buying for your daughters, your, I don't know, how many of you spend quite a lot of time picking that out? I, I swear I've spent some years up to one to two hours picking out and like, this should not be this hard. But it is. And this is why I think that is. I think because the women in our lives are terrifically complex. And I think that the sentiments that we have for the women who help to shape us are so much more than what can be found on a Hallmark reading card. Like the one that I read this week that read, Mom is such a special word, the loveliest I've ever heard. A toast to you above the rest. Mom, you're so special, you're simply the best. Okay, now that is just gross. <laughs> and none of us, those of us who are women in this room, want to receive something like that. Isn't that true? So, just so we know, if anyone has already bought that card, you should just wipe it off. <laughs> and, I don't know, maybe stop at Bojo's for some flowers instead, because that, that just doesn't work. You know, today we have a tribute to mothers. That's what we're here for. It's a tribute to mothers. And the only way I know how to pay a tribute to mothers is to share with you three women who have made a tremendous difference. 
difference in my life. Now I'm going to tell you beforehand, they are wildly different. And each is especially unique. They're wonderfully imperfect. But I have to tell you that they have a very special quality that they share in common. Now I'll tell you what that is. Now first of all, I want to tell you about my grandmother. I want to tell you about Edna's smile. Everything about my grandma Edna seemed very small. She was a very small lady. She was only about four foot ten. So she just had a, you know, I, I remember as I was growing up and as I eventually passed her, I didn't really realize as children don't realize that they're growing. One day I looked at her and I said, Grandma, are, are you shrinking? And maybe there was some of that, but she just seemed to get smaller and smaller as she got older. You know, her house was small as well. In fact, my grandmother had one of the very smallest houses I think I've ever been in in my entire life. It only had four rooms. It had a kitchen, and a living room, and two bedrooms, and one bath. Boom! In a little square. That was it. Really teeny tiny house. Even her car was small. She drove a Volkswagen Rabbit. And let me tell you, I know Volkswagens are very, I'm, I'm from New York, I know Volkswagens are very popular around here, but this thing actually made a as you drove down the road. I mean, it literally putted down the road. It was kind of like a golf cart with a, a four-cylinder. And you know, in a way, my, my grandmother's life was also very small. She had a very, very small circle of friends. But let me tell you something. She may have had not too many people. I mean, certainly if she was on Facebook, which wasn't even out when she was alive. But, um, but she would probably have a very, very, very small um, number of friends. But let me tell you, she loved them deeply. When I think most about my grandmother, about all those things, I think about her house. I can't help it. I think about her house, that teeny tiny house that smelled like my grandfather's cherry tobacco, which I just loved. Or it smelled like... Um, the vinegar from her chunk pickles that she would make every single year. Or it also had the scent of old books. And this is the sound of my grandma's house. It's quiet. It was always very quiet, except for one thing. Tick, 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 tick. She had a cuckoo clock. And that cuckoo clock was the backdrop soundtrack of our lives that we spent there um, at Grandma's house. Every week, she and my grandfather, they wouldn't drive their little Volkswagen down to the library. They would take their weekly walk with their um, hardback books, and they'd go down to the library, and they'd stack up on books, and they'd come home and, and pile them up in the corner. And I'll tell you, um, I did not grow up with books. It's funny because as a writer now today, I'm often listening to people who are also authors, and everyone talks about, oh, you know, when I was a writer, I grew up with books. And then you recite all the books, but you have to know, I was a child of the 70s. And so I grew up in the television generation. My mom had me watching The Young and the Restless from a very young age. And so I remember some things about Young and the Restless from age five. But then I also remember being a teenager and being very impressed by um, the Twilight Zone. And so if you think about it, I really attribute both of those to myself as a writer, The Young and the Restless and The Twilight Zone, which if you put them together is a very kind of scary combination, but should say a lot about the woman who stands in front of you today, I tell you that. But the thing is, is when I was at my grandma's house, there were books. Now again, it wasn't like bookshelves, tons and tons of books, because everything was very small. So she had this teeny tiny little bookshelf that she kept just for us grandkids, and there were four of us. And in that bookshelf were all of the golden books that I loved when I was little. But then I found the book that I never 
never knew that she wanted me to find her not, to be honest with you. In addition to the four rooms of my grandma's house, she had an attic. A very small kind of attic. And so in the summer, because it was uninsulated, I would ask her, Grandma, can I go up in the attic? And she would say, why? What, what, what's up there? What, 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 in other words, what do you want to get into? And I'm like, no, nothing. I, I just like going up there. And she was saying, mm, well, I guess for a while. And I said, I, I won't touch anything. But I went up there, and I remember opening the little glass knob to the door to go up into my grandma's attic and climbing those wooden stairs that were totally unfinished. And as I walked up those stairs, it was it would get hotter and hotter and hotter by every step. And by the time I was in the attic, it was a sauna. And I would walk to the end of the room, and there was just one single window at the end. And I would find that thing that I was looking for, which was my grandma was German, and she had a Grimm's fairy tale, one of the early ones. And I would find it, and I have to tell you that when I found it, unfortunately this is not it, this is from the library, but when I found it, I felt like I found something that was a little bit forbidden. And so, of course, that made me want to read it. And I would sit and cross-legged in front of that little window and open its pages, and I would just be stunned at what, would, what people got away with as far as fairy tales were concerned. This was not your golden book. This was not your Disney. This was grim fairy tale, which if you, you know, think about it, their name was very appropriate because it talked about princes falling out of towers and getting their eyes gouged out by thorns. And then it was really weird stuff like the mouse and the bird and the sausage. And that's an actual grim fairy tale, mouse, the bird, and the sausage. It's almost like the Twilight Zone, I tell you. So it said a lot to me. Um, and I think that it planted a seed in me to just like the idea of story. My grandma lived through the Depression, and so she lived within her means. She grew whatever she could, she canned whatever she could, and consequently today I have her canner. And I have to tell you that when I when I use the canner and when I pull her chum pit bowls out of my canner, They were small, 
and they had age spots on them. They were arthritic. They were so, the, the skin on them was so thin that you could see all the blue veins through it. They hurt her nails, um, she kept short because they were working hands, but you could see the ridges on them. And let me tell you, I fell in love with those hands. And I would say to her, Grandma, I just love your hands. And she would, Boo! she put them under the table. They're ugly. Don't say that. And so I quickly learned to admire them without telling her. And I'm so glad I did because I remember her face, but even more, I think I remember her hands. This morning I said to my daughter, I, I, I showed her my hand and I said, do you think I'm getting old lady hands? And she looked and said, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I thought to myself, yes! I know that people, women especially, we love our beautiful Thank you. 